Okay, welcome back for the third lecture of the day and the final day of the thematic lectures. And Daniel will continue to speak on numerical homogenization. Daniel, please. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, lecture number three on uh, a particular approach to numerical homogenization. Um, so, I can promise you that today we won't dig deep into any proofs. So, uh, in contrast to yesterday's lecture, I will stay with my presentation slides. And uh, what I will try to do today is to say a few more words on the practical realization of the method. I will also show you uh, another error or final error estimate. But most of the time, I will discuss uh, possible applications of the theory that go also beyond uh, homogenization problems. So I hope you can see my screen now. And uh, what you are seeing is the decay result that we have been discussing yesterday in great detail. Um, just uh, to re recall is that we studied this correction operator here, which was an orthogonal projection onto a subspace of what I call fine scale function. And the observation was that if you apply it to a function that has local support, for example, a finite element head function, then the outcome uh, has global support in general, but uh, the output decays very fast, uh, as you can see also in the right picture in the logarithmic color coding. And this motivates now for the practical method to truncate the computation of the operator C. Yeah, and this brings us to the actual definition of my numerical homogenization method, which uh, goes under the name LOD, uh, localized orthogonal decomposition. And now you understand the wording. So orthogonal comes from the orthogonal subspace uh, decomposition that we studied uh, in the first lecture on Monday. And localized refers to the fact that we are localizing uh, the action of or we are trying to approximate this orthogonal decomposition by localized computations. So on a very uh, like on a very numerical analysis or finite element level, the method does simply the following. Uh, we take uh, a coarse mesh and the two standard finite element space on this mesh, for example, the P1 finite elements. Uh, here, what you see is uh, one particular basis function. And what we compute or what the method does, it, it corrects these standard finite element functions and it enriches them with information about uh, the underlying rough diffusion coefficient in the problem. So the functions we are working with at the end of the day are the ones on the right here. Uh, they are kind of uh, functions that are kind of adapted to the problem. And uh, the way from going from standard finite element function to this uh, modified or corrected function is uh, by this correction procedure. So what we are computing is a correction of the finite element function that we simply subtract. And this is uh, the picture you see here is what happens on the ideal level. And ideal means that we have perfect orthogonality between the scales and we are computing the correction exactly on the whole domain. And what we will do in practice is that we will truncate this corrector computation, which will give us on the right hand side a, a basis function with local support. And we will measure the support or the size of the support by this parameter small l here, which just counts the, 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 the number of finite elements or measures the width of the support uh, relative to the size of finite elements. And here you can see uh, the localized versions of these functions. As you can see, uh, you in the interior of this, what we call now patch, uh, the shape doesn't really change. Uh, uh, and we essentially dropped or cut it off the almost zero parts uh, outside uh, this uh, finite element patches. Okay, so our numerical homogenization method is at the end, uh, simply the following. We simply do a Galerkin projection into the space that is spanned by these functions here. Yeah, and this is one way of writing this. So we are seeking 
for a function that is spanned by our modified basis functions and it's simply the Galerkin projection onto the subspace. Yeah. And the way we were writing it the days before and I, the way I'm using it in the following will be that we use the characterization of these uh, particular basis function as images of standard finite element functions under this operation identity minus correction. Okay, so we can or in the following, I will always identify the modified functions and the underlying finite element functions. And uh, the coefficient that I'm actually computing will always be the ones that are referring to the standard finite element function. Okay, so uh, you can interpret this as a standard P1 finite element problem on a coarse mesh where we have modified the bilinear form and also the right-hand side. So we have modified the variational form of the problem by introducing this local correction. So this kind of slightly enriches the communication between basis functions. So for standard finite elements, you would have communication between a neighboring uh, basis functions associated with neighboring vertices. And uh, in the modified version, we would allow communication over larger distances depending on the size of the parameter L. So for L equal to zero, we would be in the finite element case more or less. For L equal to one, we would allow communication between degrees of freedom that are kind of, uh, that have a distance of two edges in, in, the, in the course mesh. And if L increases, then we increase uh, the amount of communication. And we have already seen that if we go with L very large so that, uh, there is no localization anymore, but we are computing on the whole domain, then this method is uh, certainly accurate as the outcome here, the UH finite element function will simply be the quasi interpolation of the true solution. Now in practice, it is totally suffices to consider these localized versions because we have seen that uh, approximating C with this localized version uh, commits an error, but this error can be controlled uh, in terms or is proportional at most to an exponential of minus L. So that uh, very small choices of L typically will give us a very high accuracy. Ah, here we go. Yeah, and this is kind of the matrix picture. Now, if you implement the method, you compute uh, the matrix that is associated with the left-hand side uh, uh, for these kind of modified basis functions, uh, then uh, without the L, so on the ideal level, we had already seen the picture that this is a matrix that is densely populated, but the elements or the absolute value of the entries decays very fast. And now by introducing this L parameter, so by computing the action of C only locally, you really get a sparse matrix back yeah? with a sparsity pattern that is comparable uh, to the one uh, that you would get when you are using, for example, uh, cubic splines for solving the Laplace equation. Okay, and maybe another comment I can make at this point is that uh, if you look at the problem on an operator level, so you, uh, so you name L, the operator that is associated with your problem, uh, then the uh, operator that is associated with our numerical homogenization method can simply be derived uh, from the original partial differential operator in the following way. Uh, you kind of do some sort of harmonic averaging of the original operator. So you take the inverse of your PDE operator, the so called the solution operator, and you average, you average it by applying the quasi interpolation operator and then you invert again. So this is something like an harmonic average on the, on the operator level, not just inside on the level of the coefficient as homogenization would do. Okay, let me, before I go into more uh, applications, let me uh, present to you a final uh, 
uh, error bound. Uh, you can find more uh, error theorems, also estimates in the H1 norm and, and so on in the lecture notes I provided to you uh, in, the, in my repository. Uh, and there you can also find all the proofs uh, in, in great detail. Here I just uh, want to kind of pick up upon my initial motivation. So I'm trying to measure errors only in L2. And I consider right-hand sides to be in L2. And then the, the theorem says that the partial differential operator is uh, approximated by the operator that is associated with my numerical homogenization method uh, up to an accuracy that uh, can be bounded by the sum of two terms, capital H. This is the error that is committed by the general kind of approach that we did. So this is kind of the error estimate we have seen on Monday where we studied uh, uh, the ideal method. So this is the error that comes essentially from the interpolation argument. And now this, uh, this is the one we were looking for. This is very nice. And this is now perturbed as you can imagine by replacing the ideal correctors by localized ones. And this error we have seen uh, yesterday uh, can be phrased in the form e to the minus cl or gamma to the l where gamma is smaller than one. And now, of course, in order to balance the two terms, you simply choose l proportional to the logarithm of h, meaning that if you want to have a universal rate of convergence uh, proportional to the mesh size, it means that once you refine your mesh, you should very slightly enlarge uh, the, the patch size for the approximation of the correctors, but only in a very moderate way, so in a logarithmic fashion. And if you do that, you get really uh, accuracy independent of uh, any kind of uh, underlying regularity or oscillatory scales of the coefficient. Yeah, and this really holds uh, in for essentially all mesh sizes, so there is no longer any sort of pre-asymptotic regime where you wouldn't observe uh, the perfect rate. Okay, and then there's, of course, one more step that we have to do, and that is, uh, uh, so far we have, for the approximation of the correction operator, we have uh, essentially localized the computation from the global domain to localized subdomains to patches of finite elements, but of course, uh, still, this is an infinite dimensional problem, a PDE type of problem. Uh, we have to discretize it, and this is now the the moment where we introduce a second discretization scale, small h, uh, that we use in order to approximate uh, the correctors. And uh, so at the end of the day, it will be a two level method. The core scale kind of represents uh, the scale of interest. Uh, this is kind of the coarse global mesh you have seen. And then uh, on the patches, we have, will have local uh, mesh size, small h. On the level of the theory, uh, all the theorems remain essentially the same if you accept that now your method with kind of the three parameters, uh, if you co consider its error with respect to a full uh, simulation of the problem on a global fine mesh. Yeah? If you compare these two quantities, then uh, all the theory remains the same. And then if you want to compare uh, your numerical method with the actual true solution or the true PDE operator, then of course you have to add the error that is committed by this global fine scale simulation, uh, which we never perform, but uh, which serves as a reference here. And of course, at this point, uh, uh, conditions on the small h will appear like the small h of course has to resolve all the oscillations of the coefficient, and if there are jumps in the coefficient, these have to be resolved in the usual way uh, that is well known from uh, 50 years of finite element analysis. Okay, so on a more practical level, uh, let me comment that uh, we essentially now do the following steps. Uh, we take a coarse mesh, and now here I use quadrilateral meshes for illustration purposes, and uh, this would be the capital H mesh size. And then in order to compute the action of the corrector, uh, we go to each finite element, for example, this one here in the middle, 
uh, we compute the corresponding patch. Uh, you see here the one for L equal to two. So for example, we take uh, two levels of neighbors of finite elements. And then uh, in this patch, uh, we initiate uh, a finer mesh that would be the small discretization length. And now on this patch, uh, we solve the corrector problem. Okay. And if there's uh, no structure in our problem, or we don't have any knowledge about periodicity or something like that in our coefficient, then you would have to do this for all coarse elements in your mesh. Yeah, this is kind of the worst case scenario. If there is no a priori uh, knowledge about your coefficient and its structure, uh, you have to do these computations all over the place. So this can be, of course, expensive, but once you have done it, and this is kind of the typical application of the method, you have derived uh, an approximation of the operator that is in terms of complexity proportional to the coarse mesh. And if you have to solve your problems for several force terms or in a time dependent situation, then the application of this coarse approximation is really cheap. Now, if you are in the situation that there is some sort of periodicity uh, in your coefficient, then this can be exploited in the sense that, uh, of course, uh, if your mesh is aligned with this sort of periodicity, then clearly all these corrector problems, uh, they are the, the same up to a shift uh, of, the, of the center of the cell. So essentially, you only have to compute your corrector once for one patch, and then you can use this information for all the other patches. This would be true in the absence of boundary conditions. If there are boundary conditions, uh, and in our case, uh, the global boundary conditions are always uh, incorporated in the corrector problems, then uh, on top of like one cell for the interior of the domain, you would have to compute correctors for all possible intersections of a patch with a boundary, yeah, using possible uh, uh, symmetries in your domain. So for this particular domain and the homogeneous Dirichlet boundary conditions, in a for a periodic uh, coefficient, I would have to compute these uh, six, uh, nine uh, patch problems uh, to get uh, my coarse representation of the operator. Okay, and uh, here is one numerical experiment uh, on the slides. We will see another one in a second, where uh, I have uh, I don't show you the trivial examples with low contrast, uh, but I'm showing you a more uh, challenging example where the coefficient really has at least no visible uh, periodicity patterns that one could exploit. So I really have to. Uh, uh, compute correctors all over the place, uh, and I do it, and uh, this is the outcome of the method then. So what I compute here is uh, the errors with respect to the degrees of freedom in the coarse mesh, so the coarse mesh size to the minus two, and what you see here are the errors in the energy norm. And uh, so an energy norm, we also we can also expect a convergence rate of order one, provided that we uh, use the correctors uh, for error computation, as you would do in homogenization theory. Okay, so uh, the first, uh, there are two important lines here. The solid gray line is the one uh, you would get from standard finite elements. So on coarse meshes, completely ignoring the underlying uh, rough coefficient. And uh, the, the black solid line uh, with the squares is the best approximation of the solution in the finite element space. So what I did is I took a very, very fine mesh. I computed a reference solution that I believe to be accurate. And then I projected it, or I computed the best approximation of this function in the finite element space. So this solid black line kind of is the best possible I can achieve with my method. And uh, in between, you see now, uh, I think I have to correct myself. I think these are L2 errors. Uh, and in between, you see that uh, the different uh, approximation that we get with our numerical homogenization method, uh, which is now used in petrov galerkin format, uh, meaning that I skip the correctors in one of the two slots that makes the assembly of the matrix easier. Uh, 
And uh, now you see several lines for several values of the localization parameter L. And what you see is that for small L, the curves uh, follow the best possible kind of rate of convergence here for the first meshes. And then at some point, they usually leave this uh, optimal line because it turns out that the size of L is not sufficient anymore. But if you kind of follow the recipe of the theory that would uh, suggest to whenever you refine your coarse mesh, you should increase L by one. If you follow this procedure, then you stay uh, very closely to the best possible uh, rate of convergence. So what you compute with this method is really uh, almost the best approximation in the finite element space. Yeah, And I should emphasize that now, this is best approximability in the space of L2 for a high contrast, highly oscillatory coefficient. And this is something that you don't get for a standard method. And there's even more here. Uh, you see some of these uh, values here, especially for if L is not so large, they seem to be very inaccurate. But it turns out that if you uh, use now, this is only refers to the finite element part of my approximation. If I add the correctors that I have computed uh, uh, to improve my approximation, then you see that all of these kind of uh, experiments, uh, when, whenever you uh, apply the corrector to them, you will get very accurate results for all choices of H and L. This uh, is uh, trying to tell you that uh, in principle, even in this seemingly not so good results, uh, the, the macroscopic information is correctly encoded. And once you apply the corrector, you will get very, very accurate results. OK, uh, now, after this explanation, let me say a few words about the implementation of the method. And uh, first of all, let me advertise that there are two uh, implementations available. Uh, one uh, within uh, a, a larger code, uh, finite element code project called uh, Dune, uh, which is uh, mostly developed by the German, by German finite element community. And there is one kind of uh, sub-project that implemented uh, the LOD method in this framework. And you can download the load, uh, the code from this link. And then there's also a more uh, kind of uh, simpler, this one would actually be okay for uh, high performance type of computing applications. The second one is a Python code uh, developed by Frederick Hellmann and uh, Tim Kyle. And this one is easily accessible for researchers because it's a simple uh, Python code that I think is also easily adapted to your particular application. Yeah, and it can also be downloaded from GitHub for free. And uh, now let me show you just one figure uh, I uh, using the Dune part of the code, uh, where in, in order to, if you want to understand this code, I, let me refer you to this paper here with Christian Engber and uh, some other people, where we also explain the eff efficient implementation of the method in this uh, Dune context. And uh, in this paper, we also kind of do more kind of complexity st studies. In my lecture here, I was always focusing on accuracy and numerical analysis results, which are all very nice. But of course, in practice, you want to know whether you can be really faster. And uh, in this paper, we are clearly showing examples, uh, for example, in linear eigenvalue problems uh, with uh, high contrast diffusion coefficients where one can show that even if you compute the correctors all over the place because there's no periodic structure, uh, very easily you manage to be much more efficient than either finite element methods on the course level or full finite element uh, direct simulations on the full fine scale. So we can really show uh, a high gain in efficiency. Now, for you, you are, I think most of you are more interested in more theoretical aspects uh, of the methods uh, and uh, in analysis and numerical analysis. So uh, what I prepared for you is uh, more an educational code that I also share in the repository. So hopefully you can now see my MATLAB window. <clears throat> 
And uh, uh, in my repository, you can download the file called basic LOD2D, which is a MATLAB implementation of the method, a very basic implementation that allows you to play around with the parameters and uh, to kind of to have some kind of initial code available if you want to do some numerical experiments. I should say uh, beforehand that this code is not optimized for efficiency in the in the in the sense of computational complexity, but uh, it's uh, very nice for uh, illustrating the method and how it is implemented in principle. And uh, the code I made available for you is uh, fully self-contained. So in this one file that I share with you. Uh, 340 lines of code. This is the full thing, including all the finite element codes. So mesh refinement, uh, finite element matrix assembly, it's all in this 340 lines. And half of the 340 lines are comments. So that, uh, and another 50 lines are visualization. So I think the core code uh, for the LOD method fits easily into 50 to 100 lines of MATLAB code. Okay. And uh, unfortunately, I don't have time to, to do all the coding with you, uh, but uh, you can download the code and I think it's uh, nicely commented so that uh, in principle, if you have some experience uh, with the MATLAB language, uh, you are able to follow the steps that are done here. And uh, if you just want to produce a nice picture, you can just run the code. Yeah by either typing a basic LOD2D into your command window or by pressing the run button. And then it will calculate for you uh, the solution of a diffusion problem with the rough coefficient that we will see in a second. Uh, yeah, so it will produce also a graphical output. So you can see here the diffusion coefficient I've been using, it's a realization of uh, some random IID coefficient, so the black areas have value 0 0.1 over 100, the whites are order 1. Uh, this would be the reference solution that the code also computes, so uh, on a global fine mesh I compute your reference solution just to show you how accurate the LOD method is. So this would be the LOD approximation on a on a mesh uh, after two refinements of the initial mesh. So the mesh size here is around uh, uh, yeah two levels of refinement. So roughly one. Uh, you can see the mesh here on the right picture. So on this global uh, coarse mesh with roughly nine degrees of freedom, you can actually capture when you are using the correctors. You can capture almost uh, all features of the original solution. Of course, in many practical applications, we don't want to reconstruct all the fine scale oscillations. And this would also be too expensive because it means that you store all your correctors and that you touch uh, the global fine scale to represent the solution. So in practice, we are mostly interested in this kind of coarse representation of the solution, which would be the finite element part. Yeah. So this is what the method computes. Uh, the Function values here are the coefficients we are actually computing. So these nine values, and it, it's very close to the actual quasi interpolation of the true solution. Yeah, and now you can play around with your parameters. This is for the choice L equal to one. Uh, I can just show you that uh, this parameter L and the patches are kind of important. If I would go to L equal to zero, meaning that I don't let the patches com uh, communicate anymore, then you will see that the method fails. Uh, so the value L equals zero would refer to the case of a standard multi-scale finite element method without any oversampling. You see that now you have the same phenomenon as for standard finite elements, namely that the amplitude uh, is not uh, computed correctly. So this would not be the kind of solution we are looking for. And uh, so L equal to one, I would say is the minimum and uh, a typical choice for a large range of course meshes would be L equal to two. Yeah, and uh, you can play around with these parameters. You can write a loop in order to produce convergence plots. Uh, this is what I can offer you, download it and start uh, playing around with a method also on this kind of practical level. 
This is a 2D implementation. It's easily extended to 3D if you want. Yeah, because we are computing also the reference solutions and everything, it uh, takes a few seconds, but this would be now uh, the same method applied now with a slightly finer coarse mesh. You see, as you refine the coarse mesh, you get more and more features resolved. Yeah? And uh, you can see in this problem, there's no clear scale separation. So I couldn't tell you uh, from the beginning, there is one coarse scale and then there's a big gap and then there's fine scale oscillation on the scale epsilon. Uh, it's not like that. So you can see oscillations on all sorts of scales and depending on where you kind of chop off with your capital H, you get uh, oscillations resolved up to the size of capital H and you kind of average out everything that is smaller. And the choice of capital H depends on what you want to know about the solution and what you can achieve uh, from a computational point of view. Okay, uh, of course, if you don't have a MATLAB license, you can run the file also in Octave. Mm -hmm. The only uh, correct, uh, which is a freely available software. Uh, the only thing that you have to do in order to run it in Octave is that the subroutines at the end of the file, you have to store them in separate files. That's the only technical step you have to take. Okay, let me go back to my uh, slide presentation uh, for the last 15 minutes. And uh, because there have been a lot of questions of how general the methodology is, let me say a few words about uh, applications beyond uh, the simple model problems. And uh, the first slide uh, shall just show that there are many, many, many applications have been studied in the last uh, roughly nine years since we have started uh, this research activity. And uh, apart from standard uh, homogenization problem and its stochastic variance, this includes uh, mainly wave propagation problems uh, where we have studied uh, both uh, time harmonic wave propagation in the Helmholtz sense uh, and also uh, wave propagation, uh, dynamic uh, wave propagation problems. Uh, many, many groups are involved in many, many places all over the world. Uh, and you can see uh, this includes, uh, for example, also problems of a different nature. So non PDE problems, for example, uh, uh, these kind of uh, discrete network problems so that came uh, come up in paper production that are studied by my co-author Axel Marquist in Gothenburg and uh, many many other things are mentioned here. Um, so what this tries to tell you is that the, the underlying idea of this uh, subspace decomposition and uh, the kind of localization procedure is very general and uh, is on, the, on an abstract level applicable to a very large class of problems. Okay. Of course, if some problems are harder than others and uh, you will not always get uh, for free a solution to a very complicated problem. But in principle, the methodology is applicable and in many cases it actually helps you to speed up the computation. And uh, I will come back to uh, two particular examples uh, in a second. Before that, let me also uh, say one remark on homogenization theory uh, in this lecture, because I promised this in the first lecture. So, and there was also the question raised that uh, the method as it is presented here looks like a multi-scale method and doesn't really seem to have a flavor of a homogenization method. And, um, I would not agree on that. I think the, the name numerical homogenization is appropriate. And uh, what I will try to tell you just in one slide is that in, a, in the specific regime where homogenization theory applies, the method kind of reproduces uh, homogenization theory in the following sense. Now, this requires a technical preparation that is uh, detailed more in my lecture notes, but uh, let me still try to convince you that this is kind of possible. Uh, 
So remember that uh, we had introduced this correction operator that uh, was applied on finite element functions. And what I typically did so far, I simply applied it to the basis function, to the head functions in the finite element space. But uh, you can also uh, study uh, uh, this operator differently and do the following. Uh, the application of the operator to a finite element function can be kind of expanded into kind of the application to certain uh, parts of the finite element function. Yeah. And uh, one way of decomposing a finite element function is that I decompose it into its contributions on the finite elements by just cutting the finite element function into pieces. Yeah. And on each of the finite elements, uh, uh, at least if I'm using uh, linear elements on, on simplices, I can represent uh, the function in terms of a standard basis, namely the constant and uh, the monomials in each direction. So the functions X and Y, for example, in 2D. Yeah. And if I now go, I can represent the gradient of a finite element function simply by a sum over all triangles. And, uh, you know, this is a linear function. So the gradient is a piecewise constant and I can represent it in this format. Uh, so the piecewise constant function has a contribution on each element. And on each element, it's simply a uh, linear combination of the Cartesian uh, vectors ej yeah, that point into a certain direction. And the coefficients are simply the partial derivative of the uh, finite element function restricted to the element. Okay, now if I apply the corrector to this expansion of a finite element, I uh, end up getting these functions qtj. So these are uh, correctors that are associated with a finite element and a coordinate direction. And uh, if I do uh, the computation of how these QTJs would look like, uh, it turns out they actually satisfies this sort of variational problem. Namely, they are the projection or no, they kind of solve this uh, diffusion problem in the space W of fine scale function with the right hand side that is simply uh, the diffusion matrix applied to the Cartesian vector EJ. Yeah. And uh, the experts in the audience will recognize uh, similarities with the corrector problem in homogenization theory. Uh, the difference is the space here is different. And uh, so far, it, this problem lives on the whole domain D rather than the periodic unit set. But of course, uh, due to the exponential decay of the correctors, you can truncate the left hand side, the domain here in the left hand side to a finite element patch. This is what I did here. You see the two correctors for one finite element. Accordingly, I restrict my spaces uh, to function that have support only in the patches. And then this is really some sort of cell problem. Not exactly the one from homogenization theory, but structurally similar. And now we can prove the following result. So my, my method leads uh, in the end uh, to a variational form where I plug in finite element functions and I add this corrector. I can do this in both slots or on one slots, uh, both versions are possible. And uh, I'm asking the question, is there a, like a, is this a discretization of some homogenized partial differential equation? And the answer is, I, I don't really know, but uh, we can look for a kind of a, a bilinear form that looks like the discretization of a partial differential equation that is close by. And what we find is this uh, standard bilinear form where that acts on standard finite element functions and simply uh, has a different coefficient in here. So I call it AHL. So it's an approximation of the true coefficient depending on my discretization parameters. And the precise definition of this coefficient here is given here. So it's an average of the correctors Q or of their fluxes. Yeah? As in homogenization theory, you would compute the patch correctors and then you would compute a suitable average over their fluxes. And this gives you the definition of this uh, discrete or discretized uh, or effective uh, coefficient AHL. So this is a function that is 
lives on my finite element mesh. In each cell of the mesh, it's a constant matrix D times D. Okay. And now this approximation turns out to be accurate a posteriori if I can show that the object that I compute here uh, actually doesn't jump too much. Okay, so if it turns out, uh, so I can do the following procedure. I, uh, I compute my correctors on all the patches. I compute the effective coefficient that I can derive from it. And now I check uh, the jumps of this corrector uh, across inter-element edges. And if they are kind of not too large compared to the mesh size, then uh, it turns out that this approximation is actually accurate. And it turns out that this year is a good approximation of what we are computing with our numerical homogenization method. And in this sense, what we are com the, the method can be interpreted as a method that uh, computes an effective coefficient on the scale H. And now comes kind of the connection to homogenization theory. If you put yourself in a scenario where homogenization theory applies and more precisely in a perfectly periodic scenario. So your coefficient is actually uh, oscillating on a scale epsilon in a periodic way. And if with my mesh, I respect this kind of period and doesn't destroy it by using a very unstructured mesh, then of course, all the patch problems I'm solving, they are all the same. So we'll, they will, no matter what T is, always produce the same matrix meaning that I will get a global effective matrix AHL, meaning that this error here is actually zero. So in this case, uh, I really get, uh, I can show that my method, my numerical homogenization method is accurate. And uh, because it's accurate, it turns out that the coefficient that I'm computing or that I can derive from the method is actually the homogenized coefficient up uh, to this error that is caused by the truncation to patches. And uh, this, of course, uh, holds true in the absence of a boundary, meaning that uh, if I consider, for example, a global periodic boundary condition, because the treatment of boundaries is different in, in the theories. In our theory, it's always kind of incorporated, whereas in homogenization theory, I would need extra correctors. Okay, and the idea that is kind of behind this result is the following, namely the space W of fine scale functions in a perfectly periodic situation turns out to be the space of actually uh, periodic functions. So H periodic functions. Okay, so there's a very intimate connection between the two things. And what we are doing here really generalizes uh, homogenization uh, from periodic to much more general scenarios. Okay, now I have uh, three minutes left uh, in my presentation. And I want to show you quickly two applications of this kind of theory that go beyond uh, standard homogenization problems. Uh, and the first one is uh, related to wave propagation. So we want to solve uh, simply the second order uh, linear second order wave equation, the acoustic wave equation. Yeah, so A here is the same bilinear form we have seen before. And you can think of the diffusion, uh, the coefficient that is built in here to be even a uh, constant uh, coefficient if you want. Or you can think of an oscillatory coefficient that's uh, not so important. And a very popular scheme in this context is the so called leapfrog scheme, that's a second order difference uh, method where I evaluate uh, the other terms always at the midpoint uh, of the difference quotient. Uh, the nice property of this method is it's uh, first of all explicit in the sense that the new iterate that you are computing does not appear in the bilinear form uh, associated with the Laplace operator. So it can easily be computed and uh, it conserves energy. That's the most important property. So it's well suited for long-term uh, wave propagation simulations. But uh, this kind of explicitness of the method comes with a condition that is known in numerical analysis as a CFL condition. So uh, it tells you that the, the step widths 
uh, should not uh, be or should always be smaller than the spatial mesh size. Okay, and now you have the following problem. If you have, for example, either you have a rough coefficient in here or a simpler situation would be you have a non-convex domain with a corner singularity happening here at the re-entrant corner, then in order to get a sufficient accuracy, accuracy of your spatial discretization, you would have to refine the mesh locally. Yeah? And this local refinement has the only purpose is to get like uh, the, the global approximation properties right. So to improve it from suboptimal rate to an optimal rate. The problem is uh, this comes at almost no cost because the number of degrees of freedom that you introduce here is not much more than the number of degrees of freedom that you would have in a uniform coarse mesh. But what it does, it completely messes up your CFL condition in the sense that now in order to have a stable simulation on such an adaptive mesh, you would have to use time steps that are much, much smaller than the coarse mesh size or the scale you are interested in. It's now driven by the minimal mesh size in your mesh. And this is somewhat artificial because uh, the purpose of these uh, degrees of freedom and these spaces functions here with steep gradients is only to improve your approximation properties, but it, it kind of uh, makes your finite element space so flexible that you cannot control it in the time discretization anymore. And the simple solution is you can have the best of both worlds by doing the following procedure, you use your numerical homogenization method not to hom homogenize something, but to kind of uh, compute the action of the adaptive mesh refinement. And you can use this to update or to compute a core space that, that, is, that is associated with your uniform mesh. And that captures kind of the typical singular behavior at the re-entrant corner. In other words, you can have a coarse finite element space that has an inverse inequality that is similar to the one on the uniform finite element space. And at the same time, you can have approximation properties as in the case of a refined mesh. Okay, which means that uh, just simply doing this one step here at the beginning of your simulation, computing a correctors locally and update your finite element space you can then use the coarse time steps that are associated with the coarse finite element mesh and proceed very fast uh, in time. Yeah, this would be the spectral picture for it. So uh, if you uh, look at the eigenvalues that are associated with your spatial operator and you look at the adaptive, adaptively refined mesh, then you see that by introducing this adaptive mesh refinement, you add a lot of artificial modes to your finite element space uh, that will mess up your CFL condition later on. And what the method essentially does, it filters out these artificial modes and just takes the improved approximation of the lower modes. And uh, in the last minute, let me go to a completely different uh, problem, which uh, I name here operator Monte Carlo. This is related now to uh, scenario where the diffusion coefficient is random variable. So you can consider random diffusion coefficient as you will see it in the subsequent lecture. So, and you uh, consider the family of operators uh, associated uh, with these random diffusion tensors. And a typical question would, for example, be uh, now given this family of solutions for all the realizations of your random diffusion coefficient, uh, what is the expectation of the solution? That's the simplest question you can ask. And it turns out uh, this expected solution uh, satisfies also an operator equation uh, with an operator that is not necessarily a partial differential operator, but some more general object. And it is actually some sort of harmonic average of your uh, random operator. Yeah, this has been studied, for example, by Bourgogne in one of his last papers. And uh, now uh, it turns out that uh, with the methodology I've just presented, you can uh, not only compute expectation of u, but you would, we would actually be able to approximate this operator here. So I call it the expected solution operator, because once you know it, for any given right-hand side, you can easily compute the expectation of the corresponding solution without any further sampling. Yeah, 
this L operator here is a deterministic operator. It averages out all the randomness. Yeah. And uh, let me just say what we can achieve. What what with with the kind of theoretical foundation I have presented, one would be able to compute a finite dimensional matrix representation of this expected solution operator in uh, with kind of optimal accuracy in almost optimal complexity. Now I don't want to go into these details, but I'm using the phrase optimal on purpose. Yeah. And uh, the strategy of achieving such a proof is that you'd simply do a multi-level version of uh, what I've just presented that was uh, pioneered by Human Owadi. And uh, so you can do what I, what I did. Uh, instead of using just two levels, coarse and fine, you can consider a whole hierarchy of levels. You can consider in the background a hierarchy of finite element functions. Uh, and you can compute a corresponding hierarchy of uh, functions that are adapted to the underlying operator. And uh, here you would see a 2D versions of, a version of it. And with such a multi-level uh, version of numerical homogenization, you can actually come up with uh, discretizations of your partial differential operator that are block diagonal. Uh, this would be the operator for one random uh, realization of the random coefficient. And now having this very nice structure, you are actually able to average all these uh, nice represent matrix representations of the realizations of the operator. And uh, the averaging process will not destroy the sparsity pattern. And this sparsity is what is underlying this optimal approximation result here. This is just uh, to give you a feeling of uh, what one can do with this kind of methodology. Uh, if you are interested, I put many references uh, uh, also in my repository. I have one more example here that I skipped now. You are invited to look at it later on. And uh, with this, I want to conclude my talk. Uh, first, I would be to thank all my co-authors that helped me to develop this methodology. And in particular, Robert Altman, Dietmar Galistel, Patrick Henning, and Axel Marquez to really help to uh, develop the theory that was required in this lecture. And uh, the simple conclusion would be that I presented to you the localized orthogonal decomposition method, which is a numerical homogenization technology for diffusion problem with arbitrary rough L infinity coefficients. I presented to you a constructive numerical analysis. In the periodic case, there's a close connection to classical homogenization results, and the range of application goes far beyond classical homogenization problems. I thank you very much for your attention. And again, the link to the course material uh, is given here. And there I've also uh, put the updated slides. I will copy and paste the link into the chat in a second. Thank you very much for your attention. And this is actually a picture of Augsburg, uh, which is a very nice place to visit. And I hope to see you, some of you, very soon in Augsburg. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Daniel. It's a wonderful piece of lectures. Yes, okay. I confirm that Augsburg is a very nice place. Yeah, it looks very really beautiful. Oh, yeah, yeah, there are questions. I can read it and I will answer them. So the first yeah, question sure. says, ask for uh -huh. uh, effective characteristics of the medium. Uh, I am not sure when this question was raised, but I think I answered it uh, in the second part of my talk. So that's guess, true, that's uh, true. You answered it in the second part. It's okay by now. Uh, the second one, is it possible to extend the decay lemma you presented to more general problems? And I tried to convince you that in principle, this is possible. So, I mean, systems, uh, elasticity, I mean, this is very general and it's not really tied to uh, the diffusion problem. Uh, it, behind the scene, this is more like a finite element, a very, very abstract result yeah, that can be also phrased in the language of domain decomposition and iterative solvers. And whenever they are applicable, you can have such a result. Of course, uh, in difficult situations, you are in extreme parameter regimes, high contrast or a very large convection. Then of course, uh, typically what will what can happen is that the decay rate depends on these parameters and one has to look for particular solutions for particular problems. Uh, 
And uh, there's one more question for which equation of physical problems do you have experience so far? I think I also try to answer this question. So there's theory for Maxwell, certainly. Uh, we don't have, we haven't done fluid structure interaction uh, and contact uh, because this is not so much uh, my personal experience, but uh, Maxwell has been studied at least in the, in the linear case. Uh, and then the last one. Ah, she, okay. Now there's a specific. Uh, the first question was uh, linked to the characteristics of the medium. Uh, if there is some generalization beyond the periodic case, uh, the answer is uh, yes. On the one slide I showed you, we are computing an effective coefficient that would be valid on a certain scale, capital H. Uh, the problem with this uh, characterization of the medium is that in for very general media, I, I, I don't know if this is really an accurate representation. So uh, if you have a closer look into the theory, so in my lecture notes, for example, uh, it is explained. Uh, this representation or this effective uh, representation of the method uh, in a PDE framework, so by an actual diffusion coefficient, is accurate only, uh, or its accuracy is kind of justified by an a posteriori condition. And uh, I cannot say a priori whether or not uh, this, will, this will lead to an accurate representation of the medium. So what I'm trying to tell you is that uh, I believe there are very complicated situations in which simply a local representation on the on a very coarse scale will not give you sufficient information about the actual behavior of the medium. So I believe in general there is no such effective representation in terms of a local partial differential operator. But you can always have a non-local representation of your medium on the effective scale. This is what the method delivers. And there are some intermediate cases like periodic case or scale separation case where you can derive from the non-local representation a local one. And this is outlined in detail in the lecture notes. Okay, uh, I think I answered all the questions in the chat. Yeah. Thank you, Daniel, once again for the excellent lectures. Hope to meet you in future sometime.